Weed Smart's an industry initiative uh, where funding is, is pulled from a number of chemical and seed companies and GRDC and it's put together to drive a awareness and a solutions initiative about managing herbicide resistant weeds. Without further ado, let's make a start at the webinar this morning. We're talking about diverting weed seeds to permanent tram lines and uh, I'm Peter Newman and I work with ARI Communications. I've worked with, her, with herbicide resistant weeds for 20 years, 15 of which has been, uh, the last 15 have really been focused entirely on herbicide resistant weeds. Harvest weed seed control is something that I spend a lot of time working on and we've got a, a number of different tools that, that growers are using now uh, because really we see that uh, rewarding the survivors and spreading them back out over the paddock is not a great idea. It just seems like a great opportunity to capture weed seeds at harvest when we're driving through our crop with a harvester. So there is one solution to herbicide resistant weeds and that is to manage them through the seed bank and harvest is probably the, the start of the growing season really where we need to think about minimising the number of seeds entering the seed bank. We've got five main options of harvest weed seed control that are commercially available. And we've spoken about last week, we talked about the chaff cart and grazing chaff dumps with Andrew Boltby. You've heard about the Harrington Seed Destructor, Windrow Burning and Bale Direct. But today we're talking about the chaff deck to, to divert chaff to permanent tram lines. Uh, we're going to have some help from a grower, Mark Wandell, who's been, uh, is entering his ninth harvest of, of diverting chaff to tram lines. And, and Mark will be speaking with us in a few minutes. It's an area where we have only minimal science on on diverting weed seeds to tram lines, uh, but a lot of anecdotal evidence and so it's fantastic that Mark is, uh, is coming on to share a lot of that anecdotal uh, observations with us. The interesting thing about all of these five options is that they've all been developed by grain growers essentially and the chaff deck is no different. My understanding is that um, I think it might have been uh, Colin Hutchison that developed this particular type of chaff deck um, in the central wheat belt and meanwhile Mark Wondell and um, Owen Brownlee were developing another type and Mark will tell you a bit more about that in a moment. I might have that wrong about Colin Hutchison, I'm sorry if I have, but um, it is de developed by grain growers and, and it was really just a year ago that a, a, an agronomist from the Esperance region said, have you seen these things? They've, there's 40 of them out there now and, and an Esperance um, head of manufacturer, head of um, mechanic and, and head of maintenance person James Buttle had, uh, had taken it commercial and been building them for growers and, and he's built nearly 40 of them now and there's a lot more in production for this harvest, a lot more have just been fitted to headers for this harvest. So this chaff deck is the commercial one that diverts weed seeds to both tram lines and today Mark will be talking about a, a similar system but one that only diverts chaff to a single tram line. There's just another couple of photos of, of one of them in action. As you can see, the chaff only going on the tram lines and the straw spread as usual. And one more photo of that there. So one of the benefits of, of doing this is that we have all the weed seeds on the tram line, obviously, where we're not trying to grow crop. We're, we're really making a road. And also another side benefit is, uh, is that it settles down dust and, and uh, helps maintain those tram lines. But Mike will tell us a bit more about that. And really finally from me, just to let you know that um, it is a commercial product now. Um, James Buttle in Esperance was um, building them but was swamped uh, with, with orders and really couldn't, um, couldn't build an, enough uh, and he has uh, worked with primary sales to uh, have primary sales manufacture uh, the, his model of the chaff deck. So through primary sales you can buy the chaff deck commercially. Uh, during the webinar we have Alan Fisher from Primary Sales on and as Alan um, will be able to answer any questions later on about uh, the cost and the manufacturing and the fitting to different headers and that sort of thing. So that'll be good. We'll, we'll throw to Alan later. So that's enough from me for a minute uh, in terms of, of what I know about the chaff deck. The person who knows a lot more about it is this man, is, is Mark Wandell. Or Mark Wandell I should say. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Sorry Mark. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming along, Mark. And if you'd like to just introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit about your farm, and, and I'll flip through the slides, and then we'll we'll get into it. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And um, this is all new to me doing a presentation over the uh, over a webinar, but should be pretty straightforward. 
Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation, Peter, and um, be able just to go through the basics of our system and um, how everything works for us um, going forward. Yeah, so we um, we farm at Scadden, and uh, we've also got a property at Beaumont, uh, east of Esperance. Um, and if you can go through, yeah, so just a, a family partnership uh, with my wife and three kids at this point in time. So yeah, we found a farm Mallee country, so around the 425 to 450 mil rainfall. Um, so everything's continuous crop over the uh, two properties. And the next slide, Peter. Um, yeah, so controlled traffic for us was um, uh, started in 2004. Um, it was just uh, could see it working um, in our on our property and on our soil types. Um, so CTF is the basis of this um, chaff system as well. Um, yeah, we're already seeing compaction and seeing um, reduced opportunities from compaction on our farm, especially on our heavier clays. Um, and just could see it opening up new agronomy options as well. CTF which is where the chaff decks and everything comes into and shielded spraying and um, and yeah, just the repeatability, really like the idea of the repeatability of the operations um, so we knew where everything was happening and going. No, next so, slide. You, start, you started in 2004 um, but it was a couple of years later before you started putting the weed seeds on the tram lines. When you started in 2004 did you know that that was something that you are going to be doing or did that sort of come along um, afterwards as an opportunity? Came, came along afterwards as an opportunity. I think thinking back oh, I might, might have crossed my mind um, in regards to in, into that, but it was probably probably actually came up a bit a little bit later, but it might have crossed my mind uh, when we we're going through the planning stage because um, we knew we have this unproductive area on our on our farm, and I well, guess weeds were a big issue too. Starting off, it's one of the big um, things to get your head around is the weed control in in tree lines as well. When you start the system as well, we weren't exactly sure how they're going to respond um, in our in our environment. So you started up uh, for other reasons, for mainly soil reasons and compaction and, and diverting weed seeds to tram lines was a bonus that sort of came along a couple of years later. Yeah, yeah, pretty much, Peter. Yeah, the main reason for CTF was uh, water use efficiency. Um, yeah, just that was the main reason, CTF, if we can get the water in and we get the water back out again. So that's still the same today. Uh, and have that's what really changing? drives the system. Have you measured a change in that water use efficiency, or are you just um, is it sort of a gut feel that it's that it's going well? Oh, it's just a gut feel. We haven't you know? It's always we're farmers, not scientists, but we um, yeah, you, you definitely know we're doing the right thing, and um, we're growing more grain. We've been increasing our um, long-term averages, so something's going in the right direction. Excellent. There's a fine line Excellent. between farmers and scientists. You're all biologists. Oh, I think we make great scientists, actually. All right. So the next few slides are just a few um, a few pictures of your year and a bit about your system, Mark. So if you tell us a little, little bit about that. Um, yeah. So we're we're pretty much on um, nine metre system. So we can run anything that's of multiples of nine metres in our system. So um, yeah, when I when I first got into CTF, the main issue I could see was actually um, spreading spreading the straw evenly back over the country. And then when I investigated the people that had it working properly at that point in time were on a nine metre system, and we had quite a bit of nine metre gear for harvesting legumes and other situations. So it was actually a cheaper option for us to start with the nine metre system, um, and. And we wanted to um, change gears, and we wanted to go to 18 metres seeders. So maybe just go to the next slide, Peter. So, so yeah, our system's based around nine metres. Um, so yeah, maybe just go to the next slide. What's on there? Um, is there another slide there? What's so yeah, we're um, 
Yeah, miss one there. So, yeah, that well, that photo there pretty well indicates our, our system. That's nine metre headers with the chase bit. Everything works. Everything's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, we use 18 metre cedar bar, and um, we um, so we got actually run the two to one system. Um, so yeah, we run the 18 metre cedar bar. We also have a nine metre cedar bar that does a small amount of work that we've got. Um, but yeah, going forward, we're actually now focusing more on going to 18 metres with all our machinery. So um, yeah, and in regards to that 18 metre system, we what we classify, we have high intensity tram lines and low intensity tram lines. So every 18 metres we have a high intensity, so that gets all traffic, so seeding, harvesting, spraying, um, traffic, and then we have low intensity tram lines in between where the photo you can probably see there now, the harvester in the centre is on a high intensity tram line, and the ones on either side are um, a low intensity tram line, so all they get is a harvest traffic, so one run with the header and more than likely one run with the chaser bin, and then we also spread our gypsum and lime on nine metres, so it may get run over with gypsum and uh, with the spreader as well. So Mark, are you um, seeding the low intensity tram lines? Yeah, we seed the low intensity tram lines and we leave our um, high intensity tram lines bare and uh, we whether we're intero seeding, so we don't whether we've got our offset hitch on for intero seeding or not. So we either have a 600 mil bare tram line on our high intensity, or if every second year when we when we move our bar across 150 mil, um, yeah, we we end up with a 550 mil bare tram line and two rows of crop closer to the edge of the tram line. Okay. But yeah, you're okay. I'm sure there'll be a few questions about all of that later on. Sorry, sorry, Peter, I missed that. When you just a minute, I might try this uh, microphone again. When you say that you're going to you now, clear. 18 metre gear, you're not planning on going to an 18 metre header, I take it. Uh, yeah, I, I think we actually will be there in 10 years because I, I think the way the combines are going and uh, fronts and and stuff like that, where um, I think that would really would uh, really um, improve actually our chaff system that we've got now, so we could actually get all that chaff just onto the high intensity tram lines. So um, yeah, we we're uh, um, yeah seriously seriously considering it um, going to 18 metres, but then the same thing, big drama is is uh, we'd have to come up with a straw spreading system out the back. So I'm very keen to do a bit of work on that um, going forward. But yeah, the way the combine harvesters are going and the development, I can't, in 10 years time, well, I think I think we will have 18 metre header fronts. It's just, I think we've just got to work out how we handle this straw out the back and get it spread evenly. Can you hear me, Peter? You there, Peter? Sorry, mate. I had myself oh, muted. <laughs> All right. Just get into groups with the technology. All right. Um, yeah, just a few more slides. Yeah, I think, yeah. Your, your equipment. Did you hear that answer about the 18 metre? I did, yeah, I got all of that, mate, and um, yeah, so no, that sounds interesting. I guess uh, spreading straw 18 metres is one challenge, but spreading things like lime and gypsum uh, is another challenge as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's sort of also why the 9 metre system originally was working well, I think, um, um, yeah, working well. Um, so we still we still probably will have those low intensity um, tram lines there for those sorts of operations still, I think. Um, but yeah, actually for the harvesting and the weed seed catching, I think the 18 metre system, but then again logistics and machinery and more complications may, um, may make it more difficult than it's worth. Yep, yep, good one. All right, we've just got a couple more slides about your gear and then we'll get more into the uh, chaff, the weed seeds on the tram lines part of the story. So the shield sprayer. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, this is just an agronomy 
um, tool that comes with the part of the system when we wanted to get into it originally when we started CTF. So this is just a shield of spray that we built um, at home because we weren't exactly sure what we were um, going to end up with. So we still use this machine today. Um, I do want to go to an 18 metre shielded spray, so I'm trying to work that out at the moment. Um, yeah, so there's just another tool and we grow it's mainly based around disease management for us as well in our favour means. Um, and um, yeah, they really drive our system. But um, yeah, we just, just um, with the shielded spraying, we can put fungicide over the row and then we um, put uh, glyphosate down in between the rows and, um, and um, yeah, so no, that's pretty much it. Most people, yeah. Sorry, I'll just get to the next one. Your auto steer system. Yeah, just RTK, 18 metres. Yep. But the very thing, the thing that people find interesting about your farm is is this one, isn't it? That uh, you've got one AB line for the whole farm. Is that right? Yeah, we're very lucky. We have got a farm that's at Scadden that's well set up for control traffic. Um, but uh, yeah, we just tried to keep it simple from the start and we just set up one AB point on the um, on the western side of the property and uh, goes all the way across to the eastern side so everything runs north south um, and and then from there we've moved things around and, and put in new tracks and stuff like that to line up um, to square everything up with our um, controlled traffic yeah so we're lucky that our farm is set up well in that in that regard. Yep. And um, one question, Mark, your decision to go north-south with those tram lines, was that a practicality thing with the sun and that sort of thing or was that the agronomic advice at the time? How did you make that decision? There's no real, I guess there's been more work done since we got into it in, in regards to seeding east, west, north, south um, and you would, in regards to um, light and weeds and stuff like that but it was more we, we tend to, with the sun, north-south is better. Uh, we harvest our field peas north-south. Uh, we'd never be able to really harvest field peas east-west because they lay across the wind, prevailing winds from the south, uh, from yep. the west. Um, and then also, it was also consideration when we were looking at the wide row um, beans in relation to the sunlight there. Um, picking up the sunlight on each side of the plant as the sun came across. Um, yep. But yeah, our farm is also better set up working north-south. The longest runs are north-south in 95% of the paddocks. And, um, yep, and there's a, there's a question just come in from Ben Everingham who's asking what system do you use to seed the low intensity tram lines but not the high intensity lines? Uh, we just still use this DBS. We just um, we can go straight through that chaff, um, yeah, with our standard DBS setup. So, um, yeah, that's that's no drums. We don't do anything special there. We just go through it with the with the DBS and the you chaff just have a rolls system. around. You have a system to switch off a couple of rows, do you? On the low intensity or the high intensity? On the high intensity. On the high intensity, well, we leave them bare every 18 metres. So, no, I don't switch them. Um, we just every 18 metres sets up where the tractor goes, so it just keeps it simple. Okay. Righto. And um, we've already talked a little bit about this, but you are seeing the improved water holding capacity and, and better water use efficiency as a result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, um, we're seeing, you know, the water goes in and you just go out there after a heavy rain or something with a shovel and the, and the probe and, and um, yeah, it's just chalk and cheese. So, um, yeah. we we got, I guess we got out of sheep. I guess we got out of sheep because of compaction. So, um, I guess we recognised compaction back in those days earlier than this. And and uh, twenty ton machinery definitely is worse than a mob of sheep. I guess. Yeah, and I have been to your place with you when it was wet and you had the probe out and you could push it in with one hand very easily, but on the tram line you had to really work at it to get it in. Um, and just a couple more on the system. You've got there that 
the, the tram lines are sinking and that's positive. Can you tell us about that and why is that a positive result? Well, it just sees that it tells me that we are we are um, getting our compaction all into that one site and our other soil is really, well, I'd like to think that it's lifting, that we are getting more air into it and opening it up. Um, so, like, if it's sinking, it's, um, I wouldn't, that's what's naturally going to happen, same as if you drive down a road with a car constantly down the same track. Um, so it's not a big thing, it's actually showing you that your system's working. Um, what we do find with these depressions is it actually helps our weed seed collection system and actually helps keep the seeds in that area because um, uh, it's like a hollow, you know, so naturally like you see weed seeds will go into the bottom of old furrows. Well, it's the same with the tram line, the weed seeds will tend to get eroded, I guess, into the bottom of the tram lines. Yep, and, uh, and you do renovate those tram lines. Yeah, you got the next slide. Yeah, yeah, we do use a renovator. Um, yeah, been, I wouldn't say I'll go mad with the renovator because um, you can, but, and we've also got to monitor this when we do this in our operation. We have to be very careful of when we do it in regards to the weed side of things, when we can control the weeds that we, because you're actually going to stir, stir all the weeds up. Um, yep. So, um, and also, yeah, how it fits in with trash and um, you can see that's been done there in canola stubble that has been um, stubble crunched. So uh, that's another issue, trying to renov renovate into heavy, heavy stubble and then pull that back in your trams and whether that creates trash flow issues at seeding. So yeah, but you do have to be mindful of what you're stirring up when you do this renovating as well. Right, so that's been quite a big uh, session on your system, Mark, but I think it's important to understand all of that before we start talking about putting the seeds on the tram lines. Um, and that's where we are now. You, um, you, that's not a great slide to read, but um, you did notice that uh, you had a lot of ryegrass on your tram lines and you had water ponding in the depressions. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you were seeing before you, um, you started to divert the seeds there? Um. Yeah, we sort of uh, we sort of did make a mistake when we first started controlled traffic because we um, we still we still had a, a 27 metre boom spray in the system with uh, with sort of just visual guidance. So we actually were using these tram lines to guide. Um, so when we first started, I actually left bare tram lines every nine metres, which was a mistake. Um, we had had issues with the weeds in all those tram lines because we couldn't keep the traffic on them um, and they and we didn't have a compacted tram line then either. It was just like half, it was just like normal. We hadn't started the compaction process. Um, so yeah, we just, this is probably related to problems in our control traffic system is the rutting and water ponding in the clay. We have um, areas of um, sort of crab holes and the water can pond and pool in there so they can actually create little dams and stay full with water for, for quite a period of time. Um, we used to also swathing because we like with the swathing barley as well for to catch ryegrass early um, and then we wanted to and also harvest management and trying to work out how to get that in there. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's before when we started with the bed, yeah, bed tram lines. We were getting um, high numbers of ryegrass because there was no competition in there. You see, and it was still a quite a good environment for them. Yeah, and so this this was the first bit of gear that you started using to put the seeds on the tram lines that you developed in partnership with Owen Brownley, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yep, yeah, Owen had already started with it, and um, so we um, went forward. So we. We had a true, true fab um, chaff blower on the back and we had to get it with a left hand drive, right hand discharge so we could maintain our back axle on three metres. Um, so yeah, it had to be left hand drive, right hand discharge. Um, we made these cyclones, so that's sort of the biggest cyclone we could fit in there. I don't think it was quite, wasn't big enough for the amount of air volume that we were, I think, 
air volume that was measured was 32 metres a second or something that was coming out. So the side points just needed to take the wind out so it doesn't blast it down onto the ground, is that right? Yeah, yep, so it takes the wind out of it so it doesn't blast it down onto the and spread it all out. So we were still getting uh, wind coming out, but uh, not a much, not as much. But we could yeah control it within those tram lines. So so this was just a fixed on one side. So wherever you drove, that was the side the tram line got um, the chaff placed on it. Um, so that's harvesting there. So. Um, yeah, that was a fixed system, so whether you went north or south, the chaff just went on the same side. And um, yeah, we worked with that for a while. We just yeah, had a lot of high moving points, so we had a bit of frustrating fun the first year or two, um, trying to get the system to work and um, handling more like handling um, tougher material as well when we're harvesting high moisture and earlier in the season. Um, so yeah, we had to work through all that. So, um, but yeah, so the basis, this slide here, the basis for us looking at uh, weed seeds was that once we had this system in place, um, my still my main basis is that we're actually just taking our weed seeds away from our productive area of the farm and um, putting them in our least productive country. So um, it's pretty much you've got these strips of of soil or um, in your in your on your farm now you've got these roadways that so it's just a case of taking the weed seeds off your most productive part and putting it on the least productive part. So that's still the basis of why we're doing it now. Um, and then we because everything's repeatable, um, we know where everything is and we can do different control strategies um, through the season to uh, manage these areas as well. So Yep, and so then the next step was you wanted to just put them all on the same tram lines, so you changed the change to this bit of gear. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this, Mark? Yeah, so we actually changed from John Deere to New Holland Combines, and um, because we're on the nine metre system, um, I still wanted to um, keep the weed seeds as confined as possible, because you still have that um, leakage on the edge rows. Um, so um, the basis of the whole system as well is it's a bit like a pile of mouldy grain, I guess, like if you pile things on top of each other and make them compete and um, you, you're going to uh, limit their yield potential, I guess, the, is one way to explain it. So the amount they can reproduce is going to be minimised. So I didn't want to go to two rows of chaff every nine metres, so every four and a half metres I would have a row of chaff. Um, so I still just wanted to maintain the single um, chaff row um, just to minimise the area that the chaff is placed in and just maintain that competitiveness. So we went to, um, and so going to the New Hollands gave us the opportunity to um, go to a hydraulic deck. Um, so what we built here was a, we took the um, chaff spinners off the back of the combine we made a um, 555 mil wide um, deck um, that's a conveyor belt. Um, we've got that just bolts on to the uh, tow hitch of the of the combine. So we just take the tow hitch off, it's bolted straight onto the tow hitch and then it's supported up to the sides, up to where the um, spinners were mounted onto. Um, so there's three hitching points, so we can just put a pallet underneath there with the teleporter forks and we can drop that whole deck out uh, within 10 or 15 minutes to get in there as well. It's not a big drama. So we've plumbed into the chaff um, spreader hydraulic circuit, so we pick up our hydraulics off there to run the chaff deck. And then uh, what we've also done is um, just got the one drive motor on one end and we've put a, um, a switching um, so we can divert the oil flow, so we can switch it from left to right. Um, so um, that's just in underneath there. So we can uh, switch the deck from left to right. Um, so we've 
we originally had it set up that it would just go left to right straight away, but we were having issues with it stripping out keyways into the shafts. So now we've gone to a um, different one where it actually goes left and then goes to neutral, and then uh, in two seconds later it goes back to the right. So um, that's pretty much the basis. We've got a tray inside that um, catches everything that comes down off the sieves. Um, we've got a bit of belting in there just to shake that tray so if it's damp, it, things keep moving down into the chaff deck. Um, we've also got another plate inside um, that uh, sits up the top. So it allows the straw to go into the chopper but also um, can't blow, um, pick up more weed seeds so they can't get blown from the sieves into the um, into the uh, into the chopper as well. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what we came up with. And uh, yeah, we um, just had those drive issues in the start, and um, since then it's all been pretty good. But um, yeah, the main thing is to keep moving when you stop because uh, you've got product coming out and it will block up from the bottom up, same as we had when we had the cyclone. So you're just going to get operators um, to keep moving when they stop to empty out the shaft deck. Yep, and that's your own design, Mark? Uh, yeah, yep, no one else had done that, so we're trying to work it all out. And um, So yeah, we just got the things pressed up that we wanted to get pressed up and we uh, welded it all together and we just used Midwest Draper building with the centre rib and had rollers made up with the centre guide in them to keep the belt tracking right. Um, so yeah, we pretty much uh, made them and like last year I had to make one in the first week of November when I decided to buy another header and we <laughs> sort of, yeah, now we now we sort of get what we can um, make them up pretty quick. Um, what we want to do there. And you just put the chaff on the western yeah, tram line. Yep, so at Scadden we, um, yep, when you put chaff on the western tram line so the operator will uh, head up the paddock, so heading north and when he gets up the other headland he'll, um, he'll uh, flick the uh, lift up out of the crop, let it clear a little bit and then as he's turning he'll flick the switch in the cab and change the chaff to the um, to the other direction, yeah. So the picture we have on screen at the moment is mostly volunteer canola but there's quite a bit of ryegrass on the edge there. Do you get a bit of that um, ryegrass concentrating on the edges? Uh, well you do, um, you get, you do still get a bit of leakage and because we're trying to run these tines in closer, sometimes the tines will be scratching on the end of, edge of that chaff row and probably disturbing it more than it should be. Um, and that's also trying to really concentrate on trying to narrow the, the chaff, chaff up to get that chaff row. That's also why I've gone the one side, trying to narrow it, narrow that chaff row up. Yep. But yeah, you can see it. And uh, you're saying that they're getting, oh, do you want to go back? You're saying that they're getting cleaner though over the years. Is that what you're noticing? Uh, the compaction is, um, is is helping. You see this photo here, you see this is when we first sort of started. So we sort of had uncompacted tram lines um, in a high rye grass population situation there on that property. Um, but yes, we're making it more hostile, those, um, those areas. So we keep collecting and we're putting them back in there. Oh yeah, it's hard to say. We haven't done the science behind it to say that we yeah we are reducing the seed numbers or whatever. Um, they are still um, still in that area, so um, and we keep collecting them and trying to put them back in that same same area in the same situation, I guess. So. Mm. And how are you feeling about weed numbers over the whole farm? Oh, I'm very yeah. I'm, we're, we're definitely it's another tool and it's definitely helping along with everything else, um, but yeah, a lot more confidence now, um, like we haven't, you know, we used to grow hay and stuff back in the 90s and we just, we just haven't, haven't had the need to um, have to deal with real high ryegrass populations now, but 
and also a whole system change, I guess, making sure in um, dri driving in a bit harder, I guess, in all areas. Yeah, so your high rainfall yeah, so your continuous, high rainfall crop continuous crop is the farm is the getting farm cleaner getting in cleaner. that system? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I would say we, we're getting it cleaner, yes. Yep. And this is another thing that a lot of people talk about that we're yet to really measure, but um, a lot of growers talk about how a lot of the weed seeds do rot in the tram lines, particularly when they get wet with summer rain. What are you seeing there, Mark? And, and also, in addition to that, how, um, how does the chaff go looking after the tram lines? Uh, does it sort of affect this water ponding or um, what are you seeing there? Well, what we see there is I like it when it's wetter for the chaff. It works a bit better when it's wetter with the chaff decks, um, with the chaff in the tram lines. Like this is a situation um, on some sort of sodic shallow soil there where it's ponded. Um, <clears throat> so I guess if you're a ryegrass seed that lays in water for two days, um, it's not going to do you much good. Um, so yeah, I like with they're easier to control. Um, like this year we haven't had any summer rain and it's been drier and it's probably the, the weediest I've seen our tram lines for a long time this, this season. Um, whereas I prefer that um, if we get moisture there we actually, it, it stays wet and it starts rotting like mouldy grain I guess as well and, um, and it actually is quite interesting when it's wet like that how you get a lot of earthworms actually come into those areas for a few days while they can get access. And um, yeah, they go pretty hard in there. Go pretty hard in there too when it's when it's when there's moisture there. And then also just the traffic when it's wet. If you go in there and um, yeah, I was looking at some stuff the other day. We did some flexi in this year when it was when it was a bit too wet, but we've just smashed the tram lines out. And um, there's not much in them, not much really in the tram lines because they've been um, been compacted and pushed out when it was a bit wet. So yep. yep. And we're getting towards the end of the slides, everybody. Just a couple to go. Um, sometimes you do spray them out, Mark. How often do you spray them, and, and how do you do it? Um, we haven't we haven't really been spraying them out that that much. Like this year, we only sprayed out about seventeen hundred hectares of tram lines every eighteen metres. Um, so we came back, and this year we just sprayed one block. Um, we're in barley, mainly mainly near barley phase, we've used the shields. Um, so then, then now just looking, I probably should have done a 280 hectare block of wheat back at Scadden this year. I should have ran up and down there and sprayed that out. Um, so yeah, I guess in the earlier days we used to do more, but I guess now um, we're doing less. So I guess that probably says that our weeds are reducing, I guess. But also I've got to be mindful that We've got to be careful that we're not um, using glyphosate in crop again, um, and continuously using glyphosate. Um, so this shot here is actually in the wide row, so where this system works really well in our wide row beans, we do use a shielded sprayer. So I guess every fifth year we definitely spray all our tram lines with a shielded sprayer because we tend to grow beans every once every five years. So we definitely take them out once every five years and then even the season before that when we've got barley in, um, we'll generally um, we'll generally spray spray them out. But um, yeah, so that it depends on the situation. So um, but yeah I'm not I'm not charging around spraying every single tram line out because just um, just got to be mindful of what we are doing in there um, with our herbicides and stuff like that. So and that motivation to do the barley, was that mainly to control volunteer wheat for receival standards? Yeah, this year, this year that 1,700 hectares we did was mainly based around controlling volunteer wheat. We sowed the barley early, um, so we, we, we sowed it, we did it, out of, this is out of Beaumont we did that block, and uh, we did sow that the first week of May. We did have a germination of wheat um, in... Um, after harvest, um, but yeah, that's why we sowed it first because we'd already had one germination 
of wheat and um, yeah, and it was just we yeah, we wanted to take the wheat out to um, to try and reduce it to um, to get it into uh, malt grade. All right. So I just put to summarise, put together a couple of slides about um, some of the the positives and and also a slide on the negatives. So we've covered a lot of this already, Mark. About we're growing the weeds on the least productive part of the farm. Um, it's low cost but low effort, so you don't have to do anything after harvest. There's no burning. Um, you reduce dust when you're spraying in summer. We've got weed seeds rotting in those tram lines and we've got weeds competing with each other in the tram lines rather than with the crop. Uh, any other positives to add to that list, Mark, or have I got that roughly right? Um, yeah, that's yep, got that uh, pretty well pretty well spot on, yeah. Yep. And in terms of some of the negatives, um, well it is only for controlled traffic farming, really. Um, so it's a bit hard for uh, growers that aren't fully matched. Um, the weed seeds are still in the paddock, so like you say, sometimes you are spraying with glyphosate and selecting uh, with glyphosate or paraquat on those weed seeds, so that's potentially a negative that we are still using herbicides on, on a big population of weeds. And it is another piece of machinery, I'd probably, uh, and that you have to educate staff around that. Um, how much of an issue is that for you and how much um, trouble do you get out of these pieces of machinery at harvest time? Oh, the decks are pretty good. I was only in there yesterday um, pulling some stuff out of it um, when I tried to harvest some green barley. But uh, once everything's dry, they seem to run run fine, you know. It's only been just main thing. We've had the drum with people jamming them up, um, not moving when they stop, and then actually jamming them up and the belt slipping and um, burning a hole in the belt or something. It's probably yep. been the biggest drama we've yep. had with them. Now that we've got rid of the... Um, the driving problem and um, stripping out the keyways and we've changed that drive there. We haven't had any issues there. So, yep. um, Any other negatives yeah. of the whole system? Uh, just the weeds are still in the paddock. Um, you know, I look at chaff carts and I guess what I like about them is they, um, you can actually, you're actually physically burning the weed seeds. I guess we've still got our weeds in the paddock. Um, whereas a chaff cart, you're sort of taking them away to a degree. Um, so, yeah, I guess we're still, it goes to show that we are doing a good job of catching them, but we're still, they are still are in the paddock um, in, those, in those strips, you know. And, um, and the other comment I would make is I, other people ask me about doing the chaff decks just, standard, just laying chaff rows down randomly. I don't recommend that anyone would do that. Um, I, I just see it as a fit to fit in with control traffic. Um, so um, I don't know about just laying chaff decks rows everywhere, whether that's going to really achieve too much for you yep. in the long run, I guess. Yep. All right. So um, that's, that's everything we have, but we do have a few questions that have... Uh uh, that have come through, and I'll um, put a few of those up. I think we've covered some of them as we've gone, but we'll run through a few more questions. Uh, Matthew Driver, Diver, sorry, is asking: um, Is there any option uh, in the chaff deck to divert the straw into the tram lines, uh, perhaps in a in a low yielding crop? I imagine. Um, have you heard of anyone putting straw on the trams as well, Mark, or just the chaff? Um, yeah, just the chaff. Um, so I guess there's an opportunity there when, when you've got low tonnage of straw. I guess, yeah, there's no, um, no doubt that you could do it. Um, so if you're, um, yeah, yeah, there's no doubt you could do it. So I guess the main reason, yeah, also we just didn't want to get away. We used to windrow burn, like swath into 18 metre rows uh, in between the high intensity tram lines and then and then actually um, drop all that chaff and straw and burn them. And the tram lines would actually act as a bit of a fire break as well yep. and help out. But it just seemed crazy to me after we did that for a couple of years. It just seemed crazy that we were burning five to seven hundred an hectare of straw and beautiful straw. And um, mm. I mean, yeah, we could just move the weed seeds across and put them in, in this area, you know? Yep. 
Another question uh, from Ty Forward um, asking about the results that have been seen with chaff tracking with permanent wheel tracks, so not sowing uh, versus sowing. Um, when I was down there, Mark, I saw some guys using a chaff deck and they had uh, disc seeding modules to sow sort of the edges of their permanent tram lines. I think they might be next door neighbours of yours. Um, and uh, whereas there's other people like yourself that are not sowing the permanent tram line at all. So I guess there's just a question around the sowing versus not sowing tram lines. You've obviously chosen not to sow them, but any other thoughts there? Um, I guess like running a disc on the side, I guess would limitate like because if you have any of the header movement, steering movement, it can throw the chaff off to one side a little bit. So um, I guess running a disc, removing the tine and running a disc either side would um, probably minimise the spread of him getting flicked out another 150, yeah. 300 mil on either side. So um, it's probably something that would be worth investigating on how you do that. But um, the big drama there too is because on that, that's where we actually have our porous, we can see that this year, that row of crop on the edge of the tram line has um, been very hard to get established in a few areas this year. So trying to work a disc into that real hard clay or real hard situation might be another thing. But um, yeah, and I quite this year I asked myself, well, should we be back in there again running a disc or trying to seed something? Um, but I've tried in the past doing but uh, fuzzy tram lines and I've never really had much luck um, with getting something to grow in there. Um, when we've got all the weeds and stuff in there um, as well. So, um, yeah, it depends on, it's probably more work needs to be done on it, but... Um, it does seem to be something that, that the that uh, con control of traffic farmers do seem to be a bit divided on whether or not to sow the tram line, so we probably won't fully answer that one here, but it is certainly something that there's different opinions on. A little bit further to that question, with your tram lines uh, being hard and compacted, does water run down them? That's a question from Julianne Hill. Yeah, we do. We do have um, we do have water that moves down the tram lines. I wouldn't say um, erosion um, ro erosion down them is a is a big issue though. Um, we've uh, we've had. Um, eight inches of rain and we've had erosion down a tram line but the water come from the road and then ran down the tram line for 200 metres and then started to cut out near the creek. Um, we've got some other ones that are running to a creek um, and they've just eroded and after that rain they eroded for 10 to 20 metres back up them just at the end. So. Um, in our situation, but then you hear of other people in different situations where they do have that erosion um, on the, on duplex country with clay over the top. But no, we've been pretty lucky, I think, to tested it. And um, erosion, I wouldn't say, is a major drama. We get more more damage from driving out there wet with our uh, machinery than anything. Yep. Okay. Um, we are. A pretty well approaching the advertised finish time of the webinar, so people that have to go um, can obviously log off and leave. But we do have a big list of questions there, Mark, so if it's all right with you, we might just uh, tackle those for another 10 minutes or so, because um, we do have 86 people out there still listening, so obviously um, we are, we're answering some questions that people would like to have answered. So we might keep going with the questions, there's quite a few of them, so we might just go for some pretty short answers. Um, ben Everingham, another question about if you use when you're using the offset hitch, does that leave you with a wide space between the two rows going one way and a narrow space going the other way? Do you see any problem with just shifting the tram line half the width of the row spacing and effectively just widening the tram line? Um, yeah, my theory there is I don't want to compact another 150 mil on my paddock and also running the track machine on a tram line that um, you'll be running on the shoulder all the time. So how the machine will run actually driving on the shoulder instead of running through the middle of the tracks on 150 mil if you shift the track. Um, the short answer to how we 
we um, so we offset our hitch 150 mil. So we go from when we've got a straight hitch on, we have 60 tines. When we offset, we go to 61 tines, and when and that tine on the end actually every fourth run, I think it is, works back in itself. So um, instead of having a steerable hitch on there, so it steers every time you turn, it's just a simple way. Whichever yep. way an operator goes, it works, and we just have like this year we've seeded. Um, with that way 61 times, so we just swap either year. We go 61 to 60 times with the offset hitch on offset hitch off. So that's probably the quickest way to answer that. Yeah, so if that you work it out on a bit of paper, yeah. I understand. Yeah, that's good. I get that. Um, this one you'll be able to answer from Chris Lee. Does the chaff on the tram lines make them softer? So are you seeing um, your one with chaff on it uh, getting any softer than the other one? Well, people, yeah, I was going to push. Um, people ask me all the time, "What does it make it lift up, or make it softer, or deeper, or anything?" Um, yeah, I haven't seen any differences. Um, there's probably something there measurable, but um, visually, I haven't seen any difference in regards to where the chaff goes and and actual the the levelness of the tram lines. Yep. Um, here's one from Harry Pye. When you fallow spray. Can you afford to sometimes only spray the western tram line, or do the weed seeds still find a way to spread across the whole nine metres? When we um, fallow spray? Yeah, so I guess uh, we're yeah, yeah, talking yeah. about so when, you, spray, when we've got high, yeah, we still, you've still got your population, you're still going to have a population of weeds outside. Um, so in those situations, we can turn the nozzles on over the, the extra nozzle on over the tram lines um, and give them a higher rate and, and still broad acre spray the paddock. Um, or we also in fallow, we use a weed seeker so we can weed seek um, uh, those areas and then just turn on those weed seeker cameras that run over the tram lines as well if we just want to continuously spray out those tram lines. Or we can just, with other cases, we just weed seed the whole paddock. So if there's green stuff in the tram line as well, it'll just everything will turn on. Um, but yeah, generally, it doesn't actually change our management as much as you would think um, with what we do. It's pretty much, um, I guess, if you've got a weed mainly going out there chasing the weeds. If you've got a weed, you're still going to have weeds in your paddock, you know. So. I guess we're always chasing new weeds, so we're always spraying something, so yeah. Yep, and just a couple more questions to go, everyone, before we cut it off. Uh, Russell Zwa is asking, um, do you think um, if you put chaff on the 18 metre tram lines, would you ever get too much chaff on them? You've been doing that for quite a while, Mark, and you're sort of telling us that you don't really see it building up. They, they look pretty similar to one another. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's going to be an issue. No, I think it'll break down in time, um, and it does break down this year. Like I say, it's been a dry year; hasn't broken down as much. Um, and then when it's wet, it's just interesting. It's high intensity of nutrients there, and they've got worms coming into those areas and picking those nutrients up and moving them out again. I guess so. Um, yep. Yeah. No, I don't see it being an issue. Uh, Craig Roosh is asking uh, any thoughts on what percentage of ryegrass is actually germinating on these tram lines given that it's a fairly hostile, compacted environment and, and I'd add to that there's also the um, the rotting going on. So what percent would you, and this is a straight out guess I would imagine, but what percentage of the ryegrass do you think germinates and what percent do you think just sort of rots and, uh, and weathers away? Got no idea Peter. Um, I'll let a scientist to measure that for me. Um, so yeah, I'd have have no idea, but it must when it when it does when it gets wet and rots, it must be a fairly high percentage because, like I say, this year's been drier and we've had a, a lot of grass come up in the tram lines. Whereas when we've had a wet summer, they've been re really quite good. So, um, but also they've had we've had options to knock them down previously before the crop goes in. So we've had a good two or three knocks on them beforehand, so yep. Um, yep. yeah, but it could be, it would be quite high I think in a lot of, in some real, uh, in some situations, but in other situations when it's dry, probably probably minimal I guess. 
Yep, okay. And uh, we're getting to the end, so we'll just do one or two more questions. Well, we might just finish on this last one, Mark. Um, and this is a question from Maury Street, and it probably sums everything up. Um, would you uh, stick with the chaff deck, or would you move to a uh, commercial Harrington seed destructor fitted to the back of the header uh, when that becomes commercial? So, given that the Harrington seed destructor will probably come with a much bigger price tag, or it will, uh, will you stick with what you're doing, or would you consider going down that path in the future? Um, I'd say you're going to keep an open mind, and yes, I would consider the seed destructor. Um, key thing is it'd be interesting to know what dollars of nutrients we're actually um, putting in our tram lines, whether they're of a value being spread back on the paddock. And um, and also probably just the same thing, we're using another tool because we're, we're not exposing those weed seeds to herbicides again. We're actually using a mechanical tool, which we need to bring more of into our system, mechanical tools. Um, so yeah, I would yeah I would consider it, and I have thought that well maybe one day would do I set up one combine that's um, got a seed destructor on it and concentrate and do certain paddocks you know and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I would say yeah I would would consider it. So yeah. Okay, well that's a good way to wrap it up. Thanks again, Mark, for your time. Um, you've had a week of frustration dealing with technical glitches getting ready for harvest, and we've added a bit of frustration with technical glitches pre presenting a webinar, but fortunately it's gone well and, um, and we've had good attendance. So thanks everyone for listening. Thanks very much to Mark for sharing all of that knowledge. This is an area where we've got more grower experience than we have science, and, and Mark's uh, experience is absolutely fantastic. So. Uh, a big thank you to Mark, and just a reminder that uh, the webinar today was uh, was a Weed Smart webinar. This uh, webinar will be recorded and will go up on the Weed Smart website for uh, anyone who wants to have a look at something else that they forgot later on, or perhaps uh, might like to recommend it to someone who didn't get to see it. So thanks everyone. We'll close the webinar there, and uh, and we'll see you next time. There'll be more Weed Smart webinars. Uh, there'll be a couple more in February, I believe, uh, but there we won't be.